Good morning, everybody. My name is Susan Goldberg, and I'm editor-in-chief of National Geographic and editorial di uh, director of National Geographic Partners, which means I handle our journalism across our, our platforms. I'm so delighted today to introduce today's session, which is going to uh, feature photographer, writer, adventurer, climber, Peter McBride. Uh, Pete has been working with National Geographic for the last 20 years. He's traveled uh, to more than 75 countries uh, to do stories for us, for Smithsonian, for Outside Magazine, and others. Today he is going to tell you about an amazing journey that he and writer Kevin Fedarko went on in 2016. They traveled across the Grand Canyon, 71 days, 750 miles, and they went into parts of the canyon that about 99% of people never see. And for after doing this, Peter and Kevin were awarded the um, National Geographic Adventurer of the Year for 2016. Um, they, they were named that. But what's really much more important than that, I think, is that this story tells you a lot about human resilience and the threats that are faced by the Grand Canyon, which is going to be 100 years old, or it's been a national park for 100 years um, coming next month. So I think this is a really important and good time to look back at the canyon, what's there, what's threatened. And with that, I give you Peter McBride. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all for coming out this morning and braving the cold. I am going to take you um, to a place that's a little warmer. Uh, I'm going to take you today on a journey through this remarkable landscape. Uh, but before I do that, I want to back up just a little bit and show you the path that led me to the canyon. I worked for, like Susan said, 20 years for National Geographic and others, mostly doing adventure all over the world, from Mount Everest to Antarctica. And after a while, I became a little fatigued with the magazine world, and I wanted to do a story closer to my heart, closer to my home, do a personal project. So I came back here to a place I grew up. Uh, this is a field on my family's cattle ranch in the heart of Colorado. And I was curious about the story of water. We're hearing a lot about water these days, and I was curious about where our water goes, where it comes from, and what is the state of water in the West. It originates up here. Uh, the top of the Elk Mountains, 14,000 foot peaks, much like here in Switzerland, higher. But I was curious about the journey of this river uh, that actually goes through seven states, two countries, and supplies drinking water for 40 million people. I was also most interested in things like this, Lake Mead behind Hoover Dam you see here, and you see these white lines called the bathtub ring representing the water we used to have. We're in the second decade of drought in the southwest, and this river and these reservoirs are depleting rapidly. I looked at everything from historical to all the tributaries and wanted to understand how this river system is changing. If you look at the Gila River in 1930, and then you go to it today, you see how we've transformed a once slightly moist environment into a very arid one. And if you follow the Colorado River all the way to the end, 1,500 miles, where it crosses into Mexico and was once the largest desert estuary in North America, you see how we've transformed this into now what is just a vast, cracked wasteland. For six million years, the Colorado River flowed to the sea, and not a drop of it has actually reached the ocean in two decades. We basically have overallocated this lifeline of the Southwest. At this point, I thought I was done with the Colorado River. I spent three years on this project, but I was invited back upstream to this place, to the Grand Canyon. I had looked at the Grand Canyon, but in my mind, I figured this was the protected landscape on the river. This was the, the pearl on the necklace of the river that didn't need the focus of my lenses. I was brought here to do a talk about the architect of the canyon, the river itself. And when I was here, I started hearing all these stories about the threats that are poised to change this landscape. This landscape that we were told, leave it as it is, by Ted well, in 1903, when he originally started this in the movement to become a national park. So I got the crazy notion that, well, perhaps I'm not done with this river, and one way to understand this landscape would be to pick up my pack, lace up my boots, and walk the entire length of it. I had some misconceptions when I went into this project. I envisioned this. I envisioned strolling down beautiful beaches along the Colorado River under tangerine light, with plenty of time to reflect on the state of the canyon, the river, 
I teamed up with my friend Kevin Fidarko. To my amazement, um, it wasn't this at all. This stretch of beach was the only stretch of sand I actually put my feet on. If you understand the Grand Canyon, it is 18 miles wide. It is 6,000 feet deep. The river is 277 miles long, but if you were to hike it and go up and around all the tributaries and drainages, it's more like 750 miles. So I slightly underestimated that. I also underestimated that in order to move laterally through this landscape, you need to move vertically. You need to move up the layers of rock. And when you move up the layers of rock, you of course have to come back down to get back to water typically or your food. We had friends cache food stores for us. And then when you combine the temperature, which goes up to 108 degrees at night, not long after breakfast on maybe my third or fourth day, you start to look like this. And if the anguish on my face isn't enough and my realization that I may have stepped into something much harder than I ever anticipated, then you could see it on the soles of our feet. And if it's not on our feet, then there's a whole other equation of how you find enough food, carry enough food, carry enough calories, because in order to move, you have to stay light. You can't carry too much weight. But this project wasn't about human suffering or physical challenge. That was one component of it. That was just a backbone to talk about this landscape. This area right here is in the heart of the canyon. This is where the Little Colorado meets the main stem of the Colorado. It's considered to be sacred by many of the tribes that live around the Grand Canyon. It is a remarkable place. Of course, many people want to come here and transform the beauty of this into cash. This is just one of the developments, commercial developments, poised to change this landscape. This is a Grand Escalade tram that would bring up to 10,000 people a day to the confluence. Uh, to give you a perspective, there are 26,000 people that are permitted to go through the canyon in a year. So in just three days, this would eclipse all the people that go through the Grand Canyon. Our project wanted to understand these issues and the people around it, like Renee Yellowhorse is a Navajo woman who grew up above the confluence. She sees the confluence behind her as her Sistine Chapel. This is her sacred landscape. The Navajo, the Hopi, the Havasupai all believe this. And remarkably, she, with her band of 12 Navajo women, um, of which four, only four of them speak English, they pushed back and fought heavily against this development, basically a billion dollar development, and were able to get a vote against it. It's pushed it back temporarily. The development is playing a long game, so it's not going anywhere. But for now, they have resisted this development. Downstream, you see where six and a half million people come to visit the Grand Canyon. If you've been there to the South Rim, this is it. And behind it, the park actually does a great job, but behind this area, there is another development with a water ski park, three million square feet of commercial space. On some level, there needs to be growth to handle the number of visitation and this growing man demand to visit this remarkable, iconic landscape. But the question is, how do you manage that with our resources, with water specifically? The water that they use on the South Rim comes from inside the canyon. It's funneled up and it comes from these little oases, these remarkable springs that sustain a very rich and vast system of biodiversity. It also sustained us. We would look for these little springs that we move through the canyon. One of them, in fact, was remarkable to come to after you've been walking for 12 hours trying to find water, and you come to one, you can't drink it. It's advised by the park not to drink it because it's radioactive. It's been contaminated because there is a history of uranium mining around Grand Canyon National Park on the north and south. This is a mine on the north side you can see here. And it's a history of mining that's been around the park. There's now a 20-year ban on any future mining, but there are some active mines still today. And the question is, how does this relate to the water? How does it relate to the watershed that supplies that, the drinking water for 40 million people in the Colorado River? They did some studies and they put blue dye in a seat not far from this mine on the north side of the canyon, expecting to see it flow out in the Colorado River below. To their amazement, it appeared here, 26 miles upstream at an elevation difference of 3,000 feet, which reveals just how complex and complicated this maze of water is. The uranium industry says they're doing everything legally and by the book, and this is the richest uranium ore in the United States, and we want clean energy. 
People have been, been there for centuries, the Havasu tribe that actually live in Havasu Canyon, inside the park, just outside the park, but inside the canyon. They say they're living on the front lines of a water contamination issue, and so they're very worried. As we move through the seasons, the heat of the fall cooled off as the winter storms arrived, and then suddenly, without much warning, it turned into this frozen layer cake, which moving through it when it's frozen is remarkably nerve-wracking and scary. A misstep, you could slip and go off the edge here. You're 3,000 feet above the river. At the same time, this snow brought a beauty that I didn't expect, this layer cake to change that, that rocky color of orange and brown into this, this beautiful mirage of white and red. And then as winter melted away into the spring, we looked out through this porthole into the Western Grand Canyon, a place considered to be the Godscape, where many say that the puzzles of rock and water get ever more complicated. It became very challenging to find water here as we moved through the landscape. But we wanted to keep moving to see the last final threat that has emerged in the West. This is called Helicopter Alley, and it is where most of the tourists come from Las Vegas. Uh, it did not exist two decades ago. Now it is one of the busiest helicopter ports in the world. I spent some time down here and I documented what one day of traffic looked like. I did a photographic merge where I took a picture of every flight that flew through this corridor. And this is what one day of traffic looks like. This is 363 flights sewn together digitally to show what a day of traffic on an idle Tuesday in July looks like in Grand Canyon National Park in the West. And this, of course, is generating a lot of the development interest. There's a lot of money being made here, and people are seeing this as an opportunity to take advantage of that. And as you move through the West, up ancient Puebloan roots, this one is 900 years old. We're going up through old artifacts to find the way, seeing markings and old chipped logs to get up this route that few know of. The slot canyons are deeper, and the ramparts are even larger. And from dawn until dusk, as you move through this final vast stretch of Grand Canyon National Park, you can never escape the echo and the drone of turbine engines that you hear consistently throughout the day because of the helicopter traffic down below you and inside the canyon. And then on a Wednesday in November, my friend Kevin and I finally took our last step across the northwest corner of Grand Canyon National Park a step that represented roughly 750, 800 miles, hard to calculate accurately. Eight trips over 13 months, eight pairs of shoes, four sprained ankles, two broken fingers, a case of hypernatremia, thousands of cactus injuries, two girlfriends, the list goes on and on. <laughs> but again, this wasn't about our journey, it was about this place and the remarkable richness that's inside it, the biodiversity, the 700 species, the 91 mammals, the 41 reptiles, the 20 amphibians that live and call this place home. The late author Edward Abbey once wrote that you have to walk, better yet crawl, on hands and knees through the sagebrush and the sandstone and the cactus. And when traces of blood start to mark your trail, then you will see something. Maybe. So what did we see? Ultimately, this was a way to shine a light on our most iconic national park in America. And after doing this and looking back on it, I come away with three lessons. The first for me is that when we think of Grand Canyon, we often define it with the visual, with our eye. We think of it in color and texture. But after spending over a year in this place, I come away with what sticks with me the most is defined with the auditory. It is the silence. It is the rich and profound liquid silence that hangs over this landscape. A silence that isn't void of noise. It's just void of mechanical noise. It's hearing the wisp of bat wings in the morning or the distant call of sheep across the canyon. It's so silent at times that the microphones on my camera actually would buzz because they're calibrated to a noisier silence. And you quickly realize how fragile this is by the machines we bring in to visit it. The second lesson 
happens about this time every day. No matter how hard the journey was, each time, each evening, as we sat above the river, typically, we usually walked away from the river. It's too complicated to walk next to the river. You would hear the distant drone of that American Nile below you, distantly rumbling. But as the night swept in, you would realize that there was another river that crept over you every single night. And that was the second river, the River of Stars, that seems to hold you in between its hand and the river below. And if we step up and look at the United States, thanks to the help of NASA, you understand how rich and unique this starlight is, this night sky is, because you see the sweep of starlight moving across the United States. And if you look out on the western side, you feel a few dark spots on the map, one of which right there is the Grand Canyon, the only canyon you can see from outer space. And when you're in this space, you realize just how remarkable it is. lesson is that when we look into this remarkable landscape, we often think of it as empty. But in fact, it is richly filled with not just biodiversity, but the tools of the people that came before us, the ancient Puebloans that called this their home. You can find their tools. You can find evidence of where they stored their food and granaries up here on the right. And in secret places, in certain spots in the canyon that we don't reveal because there's too much looting of it, you see their artwork paintings that date back some 4,000 years old. And then we often ask, well, where did these people go? But you quickly realize they haven't gone anywhere. They're all around the park. There are 11 Native American tribes that live in and around Grand Canyon National Park. And they are on every side of the issue on a precipice trying to understand how we balance conservation and access, development and preservation. Which leaves us with the question, as this, can't, this national park is on the verge of turning 100 years old, is how do we see it? Do we see this place as amusement, something we check off the bucket list, or do we see it as sacred and sacrosanct? A living classroom of geology, archaeology, biodiversity, shrouded in silence and soaked in starlight? As we pass it from one generation to the next, we have to keep that in mind because there are already over 400 amusement parks across the United States. And there is only one place that looks like this. Thank you very much. Pete, thank you so much. That's just beautiful and um, so meaningful. Um, I guess I want. I We've got some opportunity to actually involve you all with questions, and I should have said this before. You can send questions if you've got them. You could actually raise your hand or send them to uh, wef.ch slash beta zone, and then I've got, I'll have them here. But let me just start out by asking you. You posed that question between access and, develop, and, um, access and keeping it pure, if you will. Where do you personally come down on it after having gone on this amazing journey? Uh, personally, I believe that if you are to visit this place, it is such a unique landscape that it deserves due diligence. It, it deserves time. It deserves people need to go into it and visit and respect it in a way and, and, and soak up the silence, sit on it and contemplate it, because I think that's when it's most rewarding. Uh, if you go in and visit it in the five-minute splash and quick champagne breakfast concept, I think you're missing the greatest wonders of it, um, one of which being silence. So it's, it is a complicated balance as numbers grow, but I think the actual park does a great job. Uh, and what's interesting is a lot of these native tribal lands that surround it, they're the ones that are trying to figure out 
commercial tourism opportunities. And I think this is the challenge that the park faces as we move forward. So out of all of that development that you showed uh, that's potential on the North Rim, what do, you, what do you actually think is gonna happen? Do you think that'll ultimately go through or will it be stopped? Uh, do I think it's gonna happen? I actually think that, uh, for instance, uh, many of these tribal lands that are, are poised to change and have these developments, the helicopter alley happened on the, the Wallapai lands right on the border of the National Park. The, the tram is on the Navajo land. And a lot of that just depends on us. Uh, it's not just Americans. I, I believe that this park is actually a world park. And if people don't engage and understand that and be part of the conversation, then it'll be handed forth with commercial development. So I think it's really a, a question for the, the American public and, and, and tourism as a whole. If they want, if everybody wants the amusement park with the Wi-Fi and the, the rails and the T-shirts and the helicopters, that's probably what we're going to end up with. Um, if people realize it's unique and it's worth leaving it as it is, as Teddy Roosevelt once said, then I think we need to engage. So, I mean, it does, you see a lot of places all over the world and in the United States where it feels like we are loving, loving our landscapes or loving our animals to death. Um, and this does feel like it's kind of bordering on that. If people didn't want that to happen, what, would, what should they do? If they, if they want to keep it as it is, I would say get engaged. There's a lot of great groups that work around our national parks. Uh, there's a group called the Grand Canyon Trust, which works in the park itself, and I think they're unique because they actually work with the tribes, the 11 Native American tribes, because they, are, they need to be included in the conversation. Uh, we've often written the tribes out of that story of our national parks, but they are very much a part of it, and that is, I think that's one place to start. Otherwise, go visit it, understand what, what it is and why it may be worth keeping for the next generation. So I've got a great question here. Um, after people, I think, saw the, the, the sores on your feet and the blood on your legs, uh, the, the question is, um, what lessons, or excuse me, here I'm, I'm missing it. On your most difficult day, how did you keep going? On my most difficult day, how did I keep going? Uh, we had some difficult days. Yeah. Uh, we ran out of water a few times, um, ran out of food. Uh, water became the, the most challenging issue because you don't know where you'll find it. And um, uh, I think I relied a lot on um, um, my friend Kevin. Uh, we're, we're like an odd couple. We're a little different. He's a little negative. I'm a little more positive. but. We would lean on each other, so friendship was key, and just, just sort of pushing on. <laughs> Did you ever feel like you could die? Uh, or I, worried that you were about to die? Every day. <laughs> I, in the early stages of the trip, I got a case of hyponatremia, which I didn't actually know what that was. I should have been I don't know with. what it is. What is it's that? It's the opposite of dehydration. You basically deplete your body salts to a level that affects your brain and you go unconscious, coma, die in a matter of hours. And I got to the near unconscious stage. You lose your vision. And you think your, um, your body's trying to cling to its, its sodium and electrolytes so you, you don't urinate anymore. So then you think you're dehydrated. So you drink more and you exacerbate the problem. Oh, so um, that was a problem early on. We, I, have, I left quickly and thought that I needed to call you up and tell you that this was going to be a failed attempt. Uh -huh. um, and National Geographic is famous for saying we don't publish excuses. Oh, <laughs> come on. No. <laughs> we only say, that, well, we sometimes say that. <laughs> no, no, but it, it served as a really good reminder. Um, and I think what the greatest lesson of this landscape, and perhaps we need it more than ever in today's world, is humility. And um, it really humbled me and realized I had to go in and really prepare and, and respect this landscape. And um, I think that is the greatest thing about it. It makes, the Grand Canyon makes you feel squishably small in a delicious way, in the best of ways. Reminds you that we are not in charge and that nature is actually a remarkable force on this planet. Um, I mean, the, the history inside this canyon dates back one third of the history of the planet. Uh, 1.7 billion years is the Vishnu Schist rock at the basement of it. And it is just a, a remarkable reminder of, of how lucky we are to have this and have this, this classroom. So would you ever do something like this again? Uh, I'm, I, I am. I'm actually going back to do a small project soon. 
but um, here, not not at that extent. No. I did, are I'm we going are back we announcing something here? No, I no, did no, not no, know no. that. Okay. <laughs> No, I spend a better part of the following year to um, complete a feature-length documentary, which will air on National Geographic Channel next month, called Into the Grand Canyon. And um, I think I don't need to do any long, long hikes in the near future. <laughs> but I do, I do, I, I think I like walking more than I, I realize now. So there's a good question here, which is, what's the one lesson you want the next generation to take from this? The one lesson is that if they want to keep a landscape like this, and it's not just about the Grand Canyon. I think the Grand Canyon is a bellwether for all of our national parks and all of our, our lands that we're trying to protect around the planet. Because if you can't protect the Grand Canyon, the seventh natural wonder of the world, then what can we protect? So if we want to protect these landscapes, I think they need to actually bring their voice to the conversation, say, hey, wait. I don't necessarily want to visit the canyon and tram. There's questions, well, maybe your ankles don't work and you want to see the canyon, you don't, you're not going to be able to hike. Well, I actually think that the Grand Canyon National Park does a remarkable job of offering access on a variety of levels, from wheelchair access to mule rides into the canyon. You can take boat rides. It's varying prices. It's not, there's an argument that this is elitist or not. I don't believe that at all. You can go and have a picnic on the rim and have just as so rich of experience as we did. You don't need to spend 71 days suffering your way through the canyon to appreciate this place. You can spend one afternoon in silence, any age, any mobility. And I think if the next generation wants to realize, and, and maybe my nephew, who's now 11, wants to repeat what we did or a variation of it, then the next generation has to bring their voice to the table. They have to let the Navajo save the confluence group, know that they're behind them, and they support that they don't want to see these developments. Let me open this up in the room in case somebody didn't want to write down a question. Our, yes, ma'am. Oh, wait, we've got a microphone coming. Thank you. Um, I know you don't speak for the 11 nations, but could you give us an idea of some of the challenges that they're facing with the balancing that they're trying to achieve? Is it funds that they need? I know that they're mostly in autonomous land if they're not controlled by the U.S. federal government and the National Park Service, but can you give us any understanding of what they're facing and why they're uh, conflicted in this way? Sure. So there, there are 11 native tribes that, that have land around the park, and they're, they're playing in, on all sides of it. Uh, some of them are for development. Uh, the Walpi tribe has developed at length the helicopter alley and the glass overlook, and many of them are pleased with it, but there is many within the tribe that's saying, what's the right balance? Is this too much? I've met with some. Uh, the Navajo, those that live near the canyon itself, uh, they believe that this is a sacred landscape. Uh, would you put an escalator in the Sistine Chapel to see the ceiling better? Probably not. That's their argument here. Of course, they need economic development, and they're trying to figure out ways to do it maybe in a smaller fashion. And the, the tram development is, is not from a Navajo person. It's from an outsider that's, that's coming in. And so some of them feel like they're being used in that regard. But they, their voice that I've met as a whole is, let's protect this place, but we do need to find some economic stability through some native tourism developments that are more sustainable. I think we've got time for maybe just one more question. No? Yes, sir. Thanks a lot. I wanted to know how you personally place this adventure in the context of all the other adventures that have opened up the canyon, the river, you know, uh, Powell going through it in a boat. How do you put your adventure in the context of the other adventures that have gone through it, because clearly it's a tremendous achievement. Uh, it's, um, <clears throat> so Powell was the first one to make it through the canyon by the only highway that's there, which is the river, 277 miles, remarkable journey. It took 100 years for anybody to ever walk through the canyon later. And Kevin and I were the first journalists ever to do it, to have permits and, bring, and to bring camera gear. Uh, there's more people that have stood on the moon than have walked end to end, east to west of Grand Canyon National Park. Um, but there are plenty of unsung, remarkable explorers out there that are out there all the time. And I think while the 
the accomplishment was unique. It was really just a, a tool to talk about these other issues, and I think ultimately that's more important. Well, Pete, thank you so much. What a remarkable journey, and uh, so glad you could take this group, and you've taken so many other uh, groups around the country on, on this journey with you. So thank you all for coming, and Pete, thank you so much. Thank you, Susan. Thank you.